Hello, uh, they call me Tim here. Um, I'm going to start doing a more of a full tutorial on making a table. Um, this one we are going to get more into me actually using some of my tools and extensions. Um, just because it is so difficult for me to go back to just some of the base stuff. Um, just because I'm kind of particular in how I do things and I definitely like you know that's why I've created a lot of these tools um, it's just to do it in the way I like to do it and simplify things um, so I, I I'll be explaining how you can kind of use the normal cheat engine stuff like the normal cheat engine templates and stuff like that um, but if you really want to stick with that stuff some of it will just be you copying what I'm showing you um, kind of go over some of the pitfalls of what not to do when you're doing that so that way if you are brand new to creating sheet tables um, you can hopefully use this tutorial but again I'll be honest here um, this tutorial is more aimed at not even so much intermediate but you've you know you've done like the cheat engine tutorial you've created you know a table or two nothing real fancy maybe um, but now you're wanting to start to dig into, you know, how do you add multipliers? How do you track down, a, you know, an actual damage value for when health gets decreased instead of just jamming a high value in health or something like that? Um, so we'll go more into that kind of stuff. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is some of the tools that you'll be seeing me use. Um, and I'll be putting links for all of this um, so you can find these real easy. But um, at OpenSheetTables.org, you can find in the uh, extension download section, um, I've got this AOB Signature Generator and Scanner. Um, this is one you'll see me making heavy use of. Um, basically, it'll just give you a menu item in the pop-up menu of the um, Memory View Form Disassembler View, which is like the top section of the Memory View Form. Um, for generate signature and scan for matches um, with a keyboard shortcut and it just allows me and it would allow you even to um, quickly you know so, you know select a couple instructions um, and then generate a signature off of that scan for it and see you know whether it's unique or not um, and this will show you where the start address is which would be the top address of the no you know from the um, instructions you select um, and it will tell you you know if it's if it was here instead it would point there but this way you can kind of know whether this AOB will work um, so again not completely necessary but I think it is pretty handy it's definitely quicker than trying to copy bytes take it over there manually parse stuff to remove stuff that might change um, it's not bulletproof it kind of just mostly strips out anything that's four bytes uh, whether it be an offset or an address but you can just download this file pop it in your auto run folder and make use of it if you'd like to um, I'll be using my uh, template engines here so I've got the auto assembler one um, this does come with this archive does come with a templates folder for some um, does have basically have all of my templates it because it actually requires a different module to generate memory records, you'll see that my templates do generate memory records for me. Um, this one doesn't do that right now. Um, it just doesn't have the stuff needed to do that. Um, if you're real interested in that, I can maybe do a, a different release and maybe put it under this one just so that way people can kind of pick and choose how they want. Um, but just for some basic templates, this can kind of get you started and going. And like I said, it's already got some templates in there that we'll be using. Um, the Lewis Script template engine, same kind of thing. Um, this one does not include the main one, you know, really the only one you'll see me use, um, which is a table starter one. But that's just because it is so specific to me making my tables. Um, at the end of this tutorial, I, and really this series, we'll have quite a few videos. So each video will come with a table. Um, probably an archive that'll just be the, the folder structure from 
when I'm making this table so that way you don't have to unpack anything in the table you can just use that folder structure if you prefer um, but in, inside that archive will be a table as well but if you just want the table you can download that instead <coughs> and then also an archive of my um, all of the modules I'll be using um, not the tools but just the modules you'll kind of see that um, and so then another one is this table file package loader. This is just what I use to load up my modules. Um, we'll kind of see that getting used here before too long. And then over at um, the forum.cheatengine.org in the cheat engine extension section, um, there is this extra memory record info, um, a handy one that I like to use. I am actually using PredPray's version. I think he updated it and added a couple things, um, and it's working still on 7.2. Um, and I want to say 7.4, I didn't have any errors with it, but but at any rate, it just kind of gives us some you know quick access to some information about the memory records, um, be able to copy the pointer string and stuff like that. Um, you'll see why I kind of like using that. So one thing to note is because of my modules that I'm using and the way I end up using a lot of Lua stuff to um, even run the auto assembler scripts, um, I am happen to use uh, 7.2, um, Cheat Engine 7.2. So if you're really wanting to follow along with that, I highly recommend sticking with 7.2. Basically 7.3 and 7.4 um, have some issues with the, uh, the Cheat Engine Lua auto assembler check and the auto assembler function um, it just it won't allow you to disable things um, it will throw an error and tell you that it doesn't know what certain labels are and stuff like that which causes problems um, that problem wasn't there for 7.2 um, I did bring it up with dark bite and he um, as far as I understand he does have it fixed uh, so seven uh, 7.4.1 when that ever whenever that gets released or at least whatever is the next version after 7.4 um, it should be fixed so if you're watching this video after that's been released you're more than welcome to try one of the newer versions but just know if you do get some goofy errors telling you things can't be assembled because it doesn't know what a label is um, when you try and disable things then know that you probably do need to go back to 7.2 and then really I want to say 7.1 was fine and stuff like that was fine it was just 7.2 was the last time the um, auto assembler check and auto assembler functions were working right um, and, and they kind of mostly work it was just uh, doing it the way I do it is kind of weird so it's not not real common for a lot of people um, and again, you're more than welcome to actually set it up to just run regular auto assembler scripts if you would prefer it that way. There's there's nothing wrong with that. I just prefer a external editor and that kind of thing. Um, hopefully, I don't screw this one up because I do have a deal where I'll have this window up here. I've made it pretty small on purpose because I kept having problems with hiding stuff behind it, and I would forget about it, and then be showing you stuff and you couldn't see anything I was talking about and that obviously causes some problems so hopefully this will help me to remedy that but we'll see <laughs> hopefully I don't want to shoot another two hour video and then half of it be screwed up um, so anyway what I've got here um, again not completely necessary but I kind of prefer a particular um, folder structure here to use with some of my modules some of these file or folders are necessary like the um, CEA folder file folder and the Lua folder um, because my my modules do make you know look for stuff in these folders um, basically this is where my auto script um, auto assembler scripts are stored um, local Lua files basically stuff that's just for the table itself um, and then general files for some other stuff. We'll kind of get into that later. Um, but then it, I just feel like it's a good thing to keep things separated so that way I can have folders for my scans, you know, structure files, traces, stuff like that. Anything I need to save for data, notes, um, posts is more when I'm actually posting tables. Um, 
good to always back up your saves so I always put a saves folder inside my cheat table folder so that way hey, I can put a link in here that will take me to the saves folder so I don't always have to refind it even if I haven't played the game in a while and don't remember where it is um, so I can just find it once create that link pop it in here and always be able to get back to it but then I can create backups to my saves um, we'll kind of discuss that a little bit more because sometimes it is good to as you play a game um, if it doesn't allow you to manually save, you can create backups if it's your save. So this way, you know, when you get to chapter one, you might create a backup of your save or do a manual save. And then chapter two, do the same thing. And this way, as you progress through the game, when you actually get to the point to where you're ready to really start digging into making a table, you can jump back to any chapter fairly quickly. Um, because sometimes certain areas in the games will make it will be more conducive to finding what you want to find and you know be able to come up with a good hack and, and even testing things. And tools is just another one I use for like save editors, stuff like that, versioning, uh, good place to stick um, cheat tables as I actually release them so that way I can kind of keep versions. Um, I do prefer to use a GitHub repository. You can kind of see here that this whole thing is a GitHub folder. Um, or a get folder. And we can kind of dig into that a little bit later. Um, so here I've created a copy. I'm going to call this toot. So that way I've got my folder ready. So then the main thing I need to do here is go ahead and attach to the process. Um, right there, dishonored. And then, um, so here's where you would want to, if you want to do like an auto attach, something like that. Um, I've got this table starter template that I go ahead and do. Um, it just gives me access to um, some variables that I like to include. Um, None of this is really necessary if you're not doing it real specific to the way I'm doing it, but just store the process name for auto-attaching later. Um, table version, so I keep track of that. Table name for some other stuff. Um, MD5 hash. Um, basically, it creates a hash from the process. Uh, it starts at process and goes 500 bytes, I think, or 500 hex bytes what I think I've got it set up to do right now. Um, not bulletproof. It tends to work okay, but I've had a few games where it just, every time I relaunch the game, it will tell me it's a different version, and I have no idea why. It really shouldn't be doing that, because that EXE should not be changing like that, but it seems like something's different with it every time it loads. Um, and that's more just the memory. It's not actually reading like the file or anything. I could maybe try and figure out how to do that, but <laughs> not too important though um, game title just for displaying stuff um, game version that one normally I will kind of manually set this based on what the game actually says you know this is what it would say in a menu or something like that I don't think this one ever tells me the game version um, but then the actual game file version um, this would be the file version of the uh, exe version file URL we don't need to worry about that yet at least um, it's more getting into specifics of my modules um, here's that table file package loader that I talked about here's where I actually require my modules um, this is a function that when uh, whenever a process is opened it will run this function um, and this is where we just check the MD5 hash basically check to see if the process ID I've stored is equal to process ID that gets passed to this function. If it is not, then we go ahead and store that and assume we have, you know, something's happened. Maybe we had a game crash or I closed the game and reopened it um, and then reattached. And then that way we can double check and make sure it, it matches correctly. Um, yeah, check updates. Uh, super important there. Um, this just disables header sorting, so that way, I don't want to do that now because it hasn't run yet. Um, 
just disables header sorting so that way if I did click this it won't reorganize everything although yeah we can actually disable it in cheat engine completely um, but this does just make it so this way when somebody's using my table I don't have to you know they don't have to worry about doing that and completely reorganizing everything and screwing it up um, unless they want to do that um, add compact mode menu you know we'll see that here in a minute um, enable compact mode if I you know if I'm in release mode is how that's actually set up and then it's auto attached to the process um, so we can go ahead and you know execute that script now we can see we've got that compact mode deal um, can make life a little easier especially when you're not doing any more hacking and you're just using the table so I do automatically enable that for uh, release mode now you can see it adds some um, memory records not super important just got um, some of my stuff for saving and loading table states um, probably kind of dig into that a little bit or at least a very general explanation um, and I like to keep track of stuff in a particular way you'll see that as we go um, so I've just got places to store things some helper functions here for me this is kind of my main, you know, if you kind of saw that I do have a main um, auto assembler script here, um, and that way I can enable multiple scripts all at once for the first one. Um, then that is kind of it for now. We'll get into more of this stuff, like even the teleporter and stuff like that later, but. <coughs> So what we've got here now, so one good thing to talk about, um, so I'm going to be using this uh, Dishonored game for this tutorial. Um, a pretty good game to play in general if you haven't ever played it. Um, you definitely enjoyed the heck out of it. Um, there are some major differences with uh, two Dishonored 2 versus the first one. So I would kind of say try and stick with the first one. But in theory, you could use any game, so you could even use two if you have that one. Because there are some definite similarities, but there were some, I don't remember exactly what, but there was a decent amount of stuff that was quite a bit different. Um, I want to say Dishonored is like 10 bucks right now on Steam, at least well, on making this video, so, uh, you know, it's... You should be able to pick up a copy pretty easy, um, and it's been out for a long while, so there are other options, let's say, like um, the bundle sites and stuff like that. I bet you could find it pretty cheap, um, and, you know, any version you should be fine on it to follow along with this. It may not be 100% exact, but it'll be pretty close, and this is the latest Steam version, and, of course, this game has not seen updates in a long, long time, so... I don't imagine there being an update for this game to change anything if you do get the latest Steam version. Um, so again, back up your save, back up your saves, back up your saves. <laughs> um, and then, I, you know, I do generally recommend actually playing a game through, you know, maybe not 100%, but get pretty far along so that way you've got an idea of the mechanics. Let's actually turn that down. Um, so that way you actually get a pretty good idea of the mechanics. Um, and what you're going to be looking to actually hack and, you know, how you might go about doing that. Because um, that can make quite a bit of a difference on where you start looking for stuff and how you find stuff. And that kind of thing. Um, So, with this game, we're going to start with mana here, because um, that's going to give us a few things to kind of mess with to get started. I almost want to start with movement speed right away, but <laughs> I never usually do. Um, 
So what we can do in this game is we got this blink ability. And it uses our mana, which is that blue bar there. So if we go ahead and blink, we can see we use a little bit of it, and then it auto-recharges after a delay. And then there is even... Um, can't really tell, but I was just basically trying to go as fast as I could. So there is a cooldown for using our blink. Um, and then, like I said, it, it not only recharges, but here you can see it's not going all the way to the, the full. It only recharges like a certain amount. So, we can go ahead and start looking for that. Um, I don't want to use... I've only got one potion and I can't buy any more to fill mana, so... I'm just going to reload a save real quick so that way I'm back to full. So here, what we want to do... We'll go ahead, since that is a bar, I'm going to go ahead and say we'll start with float. Um, normally I'd go ahead and you know start with selecting this um, simple values only we're gonna do our first couple scans without it just so I can show you what we're gonna be copying out what we're gonna be filtering out with that um, So unknown initial value do our first scan here use some mana and then cheat engine does have hotkeys here um, you go to the settings and then hotkeys um, you can see most of these I'm not using the main ones I do really suggest is the uh, next scan increase value next scan decrease value next scan change value and next scan unchanged value um, it does make life a lot easier because you don't always have to change focus so here we can do a decrease value scan go ahead and let this recharge a little bit And even when something's filling up like that, I'll not only once it hits full, I'll give it a couple seconds to let it fill up 100% to make sure I'm back to what we need to be because we'll go ahead and compare the first scan here in a second. Um, so if you notice these values here, we've got, you know, they're a little different looking. Um, if you're unfamiliar with scientific notation, that's what this is. Basically what it'll do is it'll take this value and then multiply it by 10 to the power of minus 6. Um, so I'm thinking right. Yeah, this would make it more. So essentially what this would be is we'd have, you know, that'd be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. So that would be the actual number. Um, but it can't really store this number correctly, so it stores it in a different way. And the way Cheat Engine displays it is with that that E to tell us that it, you know, it has an exponent essentially. Um, you know, it does store that, but it just doesn't store it exactly like we're seeing it here. Um, so when we simple you know do simple values only it won't you know it would cheat into will automatically filter out that kind of stuff because the idea here if we look at this one again um, we can kind of see that this probably isn't even a float um, see that looks more like it's probably an address so this would be part of a pointer chain or something like that maybe uh, you know of course we I have no idea without actually seeing what's accessing that and how it's accessing it and all that but educated guess for me would be that that is you know probably an address and not a float so now we can go ahead and do I'm uh, pretty sure we can do an increased value scan just to make sure I'm not screwing this up I go ahead and use mana and then do a decrease value scan sometimes you do got to do that kind of thing <laughs> for that to start filling completely full give it a second 
one more increased value, and then we can do a couple unchanged value scans here. So we've already got some interesting values here. I would say these three look interesting enough. I'm betting. Yeah. And then with that bottom one, I thought I saw changes, but I wouldn't want to look at that one. Um, so we can start with freezing this one, because a lot of times bars, it's not uncommon for them to be a zero to one value, but we may find this is a display. Yeah. I don't know if you can see that real well. So we've got that frozen. And if you notice there, you can see that it kind of instantly fills it, but then it doesn't really fill it. It just it kind of displays it like it's full, but there's still that slash across it showing us where the real value is. Um, so I'm thinking that that float is just the bar itself. And we can go ahead and freeze these. See what kind of effect that has. Yeah, there we can kind of see there was a little bit of a twitch there when it started out. So they have something to do with mana, but, uh, you know, I couldn't tell you what. Just because they're kind of a goofy value here. Let's actually try something. You know, because I really would expect these to be whole numbers. So what we're going to go ahead and do is look at float. Now those are probably... Probably actually floats of some kind. Yeah, not real sure what those are. Or why there's that value. But since we didn't find what we were looking for, now we're going to try um, four bytes. Just because it's a bar, I, I would assume that it's a um, float, but that doesn't, you know, mean that that is 100% correct. Um, you know, a lot of hacking and, you know, in general, and then especially with cheat engine and video games, stuff like that, is just making educated guesses until you figure something out. Um, and that is kind of a fallacy you'll see with um, a lot of people when they're first starting out, sadly. is so they'll really get stuck on this idea that things must be certain things just because they see it a certain way or something like that. You know, say this actually did have a number that was displayed. Um, you know, and it was always a whole number. It was never a decimal point of any kind. You know, again, that wouldn't necessarily mean it's a float or, I mean, a... Um, an integer. It still could be a float and the game may only display it as an integer. Um, so try not to ever get stuck in that kind of thinking because that's where, you know, if you've ever dealt with people trying to help them learn stuff, you, you know, I've run into plenty of people that will just ignore every bit of advice that people give them and they just absolutely get stuck on this, you know, well, no, the game shows it with the decimal point, so it has to be a float, and you're trying to explain it. No, it doesn't. You know, it could be being rounded for the display. It could be this. It could be that. Um, just because you find a string that matches it doesn't mean that's the actual value you need to manipulate. So you just got to, you know, make some guesses, try to find some things, see what works, see what doesn't, and kind of go off of that. So since float we didn't find us what we were looking for, now we're going to try four byte value. Um, it does kind of surprise me again with it being a bar. I really would have expected it to be a float, but but not crazy or unheard of. Wouldn't be the first time I was wrong on something like this. So we'll go ahead and do our first scan here. Use some mana. Decrease value. Increase, increased, increase, unchanged. Prepare to first scan. 
we've already got a couple values there and I'm thinking these will likely because of the way it gets stored we'll probably pick these same ones back up so yeah we can see that that same address um, probably one that somehow got filtered out but is similar looks like these two addresses but these two look interesting they're nice whole numbers which is more what I would expect for a value like this and then we can see uh, they both decrease about 80 go up to 100 it gets decreased by 20 each time we use blink which would make sense it increases 20 when it charges um, and this is where you know a lot of times you're better off freezing but because we do know this did hold a value of 100 we can go ahead and just set it to 100 real quick and see what happens here so I would bet that's not our value because whatever one is our value it should hold so there we go um, we just seen there it updated the other one our bar has filled and then it even set that float to one and updated the other two floats so I would definitely say this is our mana drop that down there I'll keep track of it I don't think I need any of that anymore so I'm saying this is our mana so now we're gonna go ahead and use um, find out what accesses this address Attach the debugger. Hopefully, I don't screw up and hide shit behind this window or the game projection there. I guess maybe would be the better wording. So we've got four addresses that constantly fire. Well, I say constantly when the game is unpaused. Um, to grab addresses, I kind of prefer if I can find something that fires you when the game is paused, but it doesn't look like that's going to be an option here. Um, we might be able to backtrace this a little bit. And we might even do that. We'll, we'll see what we're going to do for this first video. And just out of curiosity, so we've got three that fire when I use mana, and then two of those three fire when I when it recharges and then we've got another one for a recharge so a total of three for recharge as well but two of them are shared and it looks like we can see this is a write so it looks like we have one single instruction that writes to mana whether we're using it or it's recharging um, and I'm willing to bet yeah it'll be yeah so same one writes to it when we use our potion and I'm not sure what this one is doing other than maybe making sure it's always under max same base so let's say plus four yeah I'm betting that's our max there yeah that would be my guess So, um, a couple options we have that we can do here. So, let's say you were just wanting to use the pointer scanner. Um, one easy way to be able to get back to that address constantly without really having to do a whole lot extra um, is just go ahead and, you know, make sure that this is a good instruction. So, we go show disassembler. Let's actually move that again. Um, show disassembler. And then find out what address what addresses this instruction accesses. I always have a hard time saying that one. Um, 
and then just make sure nothing else runs through this. Um, again, we may find later that something does when we get around combat combatants or enemies or whatever the case may be, whatever you want to call them. Um, we do got some NPCs standing around, but uh, you know none of them have magic. So, but I don't. If I'm remembering right, I want to say one DLC has where you run into people with magic, but I think other than that in the base game, I think it is only in cutscenes that you really see a few other people using magic. So I'm thinking this is a good instruction to grab our base here. Um, so again, we could either use here and just um, add to code list or even do that here add to code list and what it will do is in this advanced options tab um, it will just add it to here and it just gives you a good way to store this address here the instructions address um, and so that way as long as there's not a game update and the exe itself doesn't get changed um, you, you'll basically always be able to use this address to get to this instruction and then you would always be able to just use find you know use this find out what it address of this instruction access and be able to get that address real quick and easy. Um, that does make refinding stuff a lot easier if you're wanting to use a pointer scanner. I know I've seen a lot of people talk about using the pointer scanner and refinding a value over and over and over again and it, to me that's a lot easier to do. Um, now we'll go ahead and actually hook this I'm actually wondering. We could start digging into reversing this. Um, just because of the way my templates are set up, hooking this would be really easy. Um, so, uh, yeah, I did it kind of quickly there. Um, I did Control Shift Hip B, or Shift Control B, um, for the generate signature and scan for matches. Um, so, it looks like we've got one match on this, so this is a good AOB. So, now I'm going to do Control A. see that at all. Now let's go ahead and get rid of that so I don't do that anymore. Um, so yeah when I did that scan it um, generated this AOB um, which was based on that start address to this end address for the uh, instruction lines. You can kind of even see here that that's what that is. It scans this module and then it found one result and this was the address of that result which does in fact match our start address. <laughs> so that just tells me that you know that is a good AOB. Once I've got the auto assembler window open here we could go ahead and do like a regular AOB injection. Um, of course the uh, injection symbol here or the symbol for the injection point needs to be unique so we might do like mana underscore inject um, and then here we would just need to create a label register the symbol Here you'll see I end up doing it differently, but if you're jumping the new mem, um, you can't pack stuff up here. Um, this can only be code because it's going to jump here and try and execute everything underneath it. Um, and so in this case, it would start here, and then it would basically just wind up going to here, executing this code, and then executing this, which would bring it back to here where it would continue on and this would be after the injection point. So that's where we can get away with storing stuff here. And this is why I prefer a, a regular editor because the fact that tab is randomly 2 to 8 to 6 to 4 to, you know, it drives me kind of crazy but but that way, what we all we really need to do here is then move PTR mana. It is case sensitive. Our base is ESI. 
and this would actually work for capturing our value. Um, again, we probably want to make sure we unregister this symbol. And this is something um, Cheat Engine won't really gripe about this label. Um, you know, it is better if we were to go ahead and make sure we explicitly declare it as a label, but uh, Cheat Engine generally won't care. It'll just kind of figure out that, okay, this is a label, and start treating it like a label. Because it will go through all of this script once. I want to say it actually does it three times. It will go through all the script for once, um, do any preprocessor stuff. Um, so like Lua code, if we included that in here, it would generally be considered um, not the Lua code block, but just Lua. Um, and by that I actually mean Lua and not Lua code. Um, we're uh, I'm using um, 7.2, so this would actually just throw an error. This doesn't even exist yet. But it, so it would run that kind of stuff. Um, then it will kind of reinterpret everything and then go through it and do any kind of replaces. So this way, if you've got custom auto assembler commands, um, any defines or stuff like that, then it kind of runs through it again, replacing stuff, and then it will run through it. I, I believe it is on the third run is where it will actually start assembling stuff. And so by then, it kind of knows what what's what whether or not it should throw an error or just see it as a symbol, you know, or as a label and that kind of thing. So again, you don't really have to, you know, we could actually delete this and I don't think Cheat Engine would mind one bit. Again, with it being a re the registered symbol here, it may actually complain, but I don't think it will care. It's just been a while since I've tried. Um, but so what I'm actually going to do here Again, control A, and I'm going to do control alt 7. Oh, no, no. Control alt 6, which is my AOB full injection, um, the custom AOB full injection template here. I don't need to offset my injection point for my AOB. I'm going to call that mana, and it's going to automatically call it mana hook. Save that file under the name mana hook. And so then with this, you can kind of already see that um, this script is done. Um, my base template here is you know already kind of set up just to store stuff. Um, at most, I just need to double check and make sure I'm using the right base here, which we are. Um, we've already got our pointer declared. Again, like I said, I do like to pack stuff up top here for whatever reason, so I do explicitly tell it to jump to new code or end code um, and not new mem or the start of the memory. So here it does actually, you know, it'll hit our injection point, jump to end code, come here, store the eight, um, ESI into our pointer that we've made here, then run this code, then jump back to return and then continue on after the injection point. Um, a lot of this isn't real super important. We'll kind of go over some of it here though. So like I use this strict preprocessor command and what that does is makes it so like where I said we didn't have to have labels declared, um, Cheat Engine will throw an error now. I've, I've got that strict declared to tell it that I want it to be more strict. Um, not really any great reason to use it to be honest with you I think I've had it maybe help me stop from screwing something up once <laughs> you know? but for whatever reason I, I kind of prefer it to be a little more strict so this way I you know I declare everything properly and then then I place it and then maybe actually use it um, not something you really need to do but I just kind of prefer to do it. Um, again, I, I like to I define an address symbol here or an address variable. That's just the um, injection point address. Um, no real reason other than just extra information because uh, it doesn't get used anywhere in the script. Uh, 
because I, I want to use the AOB AOB scan instead of you know a raw address but this does allow me in case I need to do some testing real quick or I need to fix some bytes if I screwed something up when I was trying to disable it I can generally use this and you know get that done pretty quickly and easily um, and then that in combination with having all these bytes here I can kind of reset a lot pretty easily and I do always recommend Mouse keeps wanting to do all kinds of crazy things. Um, I do generally recommend always leaving in this commented out code. I mean, it does add some bulk to your tables, I guess. Um, but to me, it's well worth it because when it comes to updating or fixing things or whatever the case may be or just remembering what's going on, it's, it's a lot nicer to have a little bit of code to go with your script so you know where things are. And then if, you know, if we've got a game update, we could actually start scanning for different combinations of bytes until we find this point again um, whereas if all you've got is this one thing then you know you don't really have a lot of information to go off of <laughs> um, so I do like defining a bytes variable just so that way I can use it for my assert and then when I'm resetting things um, and the idea there is if I'm going to inject and then use these bytes to reset it when I'm done. I want to make absolutely sure that I'm resetting it to what we're actually replacing. So that way I don't screw something up in case there is an update and say this offset changes. Um, I want to make sure that I'll become aware of that very quickly. And so this would throw an error and then in this case since I'm using my custom one it would actually print out the, the code and tell me you know the injection point doesn't match the um, the bytes given or the um, bytes for restoring and then tell me what's actually there so I can start digging into it pretty quickly and figure out what's going on um, and both of these you can use the default ones of Cheat Engine because um, they work real similar it'll just be the error messages will be different um, about the only thing with the normal AOB scan module would be um, I don't think you can use Lua variables like I'm using here. I have set up mine to check for this dollar sign symbol and then look for Lua variables if it finds that. Um, I almost want to say Cheat Engine will take at least the process. Um, Lua variable that Cheat Engine does give access to. That's I almost want to swear it'll take other ones, but I, I can't remember for sure. You're welcome to try it with the regular one if you want, but you may have to actually hard code this module in there. Um, but the main reason for doing it this way is so this way if the um, process name ever changes and this is this first module ever changes, say it's a GOG version or you know whatever the case may may be. Um, this, these scripts can be easily set up to work with different EXEs without having to edit every single file. You know, all I've got to do is set this one Lua variable differently, and then this script will still work with other EXEs, provided the AOB still work and the bytes still match. <coughs> And then other than that, about the only other thing different from the um, normal one would be we are using this third parameter for allocate, and it's the allocate near. Just so that way, you know, it will keep things close by. I want to say this game's small enough, it really doesn't matter. And actually 32-bit, I don't think it matters just because of the way the addresses are encoded differently. Uh, it can actually store a 32-bit address inside memory no matter what. Um, whereas with 64-bit, you do get a little bit different because it actually has to use, you know, it will use the um, four bytes encoded. If we actually look here, you can see this is actually four bytes. Um, so with this, you know, being a 32-bit process, we could actually just read these four bytes as an integer, and that's our address. Um, that's what this address would equate to. And there you can even see some of these numbers are kind of just it's, it's 
not exactly backwards, but, uh, you know, saying it's backwards is, uh, you know, pretty close. Um, you can kind of see, like, the EC, then the 3-2, and, you know, on down the line. Um, but with the 64-bit process, it would actually be the instruction address right at that byte, or the start of that byte. Or no, yeah, the instruction address at the end of the of the instruction plus this these four bytes read as a signed integer. Um, so that gets a little different. We're not going to worry about that since we're doing a 32-bit process right now. <laughs> but that's kind of the main reason for the third one here, um, just to make sure our injection point is close to our allocated memory or as close as cheat engine can get it and then about the only other thing to mention here is I do define this injection point variable and it is based on the AOB scan here we're not offsetting but if I did need to offset I could just do that real easy here and that saves me from having to do an offset here and here because I've just had too many times in the past where I used to do it that way and then I'd set it here, forget to set it here, do something goofy like that and get things kind of messed up and take a little while to figure out what's going on. But other than that, I'm going to say that's kind of all we need to discuss on this script. Um, it kind of just goes back into what we were doing before, just storing our, our base so we can get to that. So here, um, mine does generate some memory records here. One thing to mention if you're doing something similar to what I'm doing, um, when we open Cheat Engine and then save a cheat table like we've done here, um, it does not change the working directory. So Cheat Engine isn't currently running out of this directory. Um, it is still running out of the actual Cheat Engine directory itself um, where the exe is stored. So to get this to be able to find my, you know, my local files here, I need to save that, close it out, and then reopen it. And then, it, you know, I'm set up to auto-execute um, the Lua script, always. And, and whether you do that is up to you. Um, I can definitely say because I generally won't open unknown cheat tables directly. Um, I'll usually view them in a text editor first. And then the first thing I'm going to do is um, hit Control N to go to the bottom of the file and start looking at the Lua script. And that way I can kind of see what it's doing. Um, because you do get a lot of freedom with the Lua. You can actually do a lot of stuff. But I've, I've literally never seen a malicious table, so I, you know, not something I would honestly worry too much about. I just still, the paranoid person in me always looks at tables first, you know. But of course, if you can't read Lewis script, you don't know it well enough, you know, it can be a little more intimidating, I guess. So, if, you know, if you're not comfortable with running all Lewis scripts right off the bat, and maybe you only do it after you look at it in here, um, you know, there, there's really nothing wrong with that because mine will work just fine by simply executing this like this. Or executing it manually. Um, but since I mostly use my own tables, it's not really an issue or a concern. Um, so now that we've got it set to where it's now set, this is the working directory. We can go ahead and enable this script. Um, I think we just need to unpause for a second here. And here we can see we've got our mana, and then our mana max, obviously. If we can go and get rid of all those. 
And so what this kind of allows us to do is a couple things. A, we could use this symbol as a way to um, compare things in case we run into a shared instruction and we don't want to try and reverse the structure or do any of that. Um, this gives us a real easy way to compare and see that we're going to be working with the right address when we want to later. Um, and then it also gives us the ability to add a script here. Call this fill mana. I hope I'm not hiding things here. <coughs> Call that fill mana, and then we can do right, right, integer. And this is where I was talking about that um, extra memory record info. We can select that memory record, copy the pointer string, paste that in, and do read integer. that four and I have a function um, and you can look on opensheettables.org and in the uh, there's kind of the Lua category there is a um, useful Lua functions and scripts um, section and then you'll find um, a post about auto disabling memory records um, and then I've got this script posted. Of course, if you're using my modules, it'll already be accessible. Um, but then there's actually a couple of other scripts. Um, everybody kind of posted their own way of doing it, which I kind of liked because you just even I got to see different ways of doing it, um, ways I hadn't thought of, and that kind of thing. Uh, disable. And then if you are using my um, modules, I actually have another function set in here. And that just allows me to pass it to addresses. And basically it will read from this address and then set this address based on the value it read. Um, so it kind of, you can basically see it's real similar to this, but a little less typing. Um, but of course, you know, write integer, you know, using read integer to read a value and then writing that value that it returns to to the address using write integer, you know, that works just fine too. And so you can see there we set our value to the max value and now we've got a quick and easy way to fill mana real quick if we're running out of potions or whatever. Um, so that gives us mana. Okay, so um, I did try and backtrace um, mana, and we, you know, I shot a whole hour-long video doing it, um, and kind of hit, you know, um, just a point where I'm um, really. Ooh, I wish I'd kind of saved that so I could at least show you that. All right, yeah. So we hit right here. Um, where we hit some kind of maybe property list or entity list. Uh, show us hex, sort the value like I already did. Come on down here, you can see. So that is our base address. Um, and this is where, and this was after an hour of going through several functions. Um, so, I mean, this is way deep in the code. And then it's like seven function calls later we get to where our injection point for this script is. Um, and it never had an offset, um, oddly enough. So I, I do feel like this is some kind of goofy you know, property list or something. I guess we can look at this comment and see what it's saying there. Yeah, I don't think that really matters other than we do see array num. Um, but at any rate, it just kind of got to the point to where I'm thinking it might be better to 
<laughs> you know, find coordinates or health or some other value and backtrace from there. Um, because I have had times where if you really try and just, you know, ignore all signs and you're just going to stick to your guns on one thing, you're going to have a really hard time. Whereas if we're willing to just say, okay, let's take a step back um, and look at this again from a different angle. Um, like it really wouldn't hurt to go ahead and save this instruction. We can save mana list. Make sure we remember we want to look at the value. The value equals base. And then, yeah, we can kind of keep track of this and, you know, know that we've got somewhere to go with this um, but at the same time once we hit here it's you know I mean again we could kind of start looking at this but then we've also got to make sure we know where um, EVX is coming from so that way I can get that offset per correctly and I just I don't think I think this is something that's going to be giving us more trouble than it's worth um, Especially being this deep in calls and we never saw an offset. Um, I, I find that as kind of an odd thing to begin with. So I've decided we'll step back and kind of do this in a different way. Um, I think I'm going to go ahead and call it good for this video for now. Um, we'll probably do another video because we're already like almost an hour in already. Um, even with the other hour video that I've decided to cut. <laughs> And we'll just go ahead and write some scripts for mana and actually get like an infinite mana going, maybe an, an instant charge or something like that. Um, whether, you know, maybe that delay for the timer for when it starts charging, try and get that down to where it's a smaller value or zero or whatever, and it just instantly starts charging as soon as we use mana. Um, probably get rid of the. Uh, the uh, cooldown for using blink just because I you know I did remember I had an awful lot of fun like blinking all over the map super fast <laughs> so we'll, we'll do some different things um, but we'll do that in the next video so anyway um, have a good one and I'll see you on the next one